Luke Lee had one of the craziest lives of any person probably in the history of ever. He was born in Nashville in 1879 and was named after his great-grandfather, who was a United States Senator. And of course, this is 1800s, so Lee's great-grandfather was one of, like, the first senators. That's, I mean, that's that's what we're talking here. This is the very beginnings of the United States as a country. Lee attended Swanee, and he earned his bachelor's degree in 1899 and his master's in 1900. He then went on to Columbia Law School, where he graduated from there in 1903 passed the bar and proceeded to practice law in Nashville, where he wound up living for the greater majority of his life. He owned a newspaper. He, like his great-grandfather before him, wound up serving as a United States Senator. And then he fought in World War I. And his time in the military, and really his, his whole life in general, can be summed up in one story involving him his platoon, and an attempt to kidnap Kaiser Wilhelm. Yeah, the leader of Germany. So, alongside future Baseball Hall of Famer Larry McPhail, Lee and the rest of his platoon buddies snuck into the Netherlands and tried to break into the chateau that Kaiser Wilhelm was staying at so that they could drag him back to Paris to have him serve trial for his war crime. Now, now, the way that Lee attempted to do this was that he claimed to be the son of the local count, which, like, obviously that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Cover was blown. The group was forced to run away fast as lightning, and the only thing that they were able to kidnap out of this whole expedition was a bronze-encrusted ashtray. So they tried one of the greatest heights, heists of the war, one of the greatest heists of the war, and all they got out of it was a crummy ashtray. Well, after the war was over, Lee goes back to Nashville and gets into banking. He was later arrested for bank fraud, which he claimed he was framed for, fought that conviction of fraud for years, took it all the way up to the Supreme Court and only stopped appealing when the Supreme Court refused to hear his case. He then served two years in a Raleigh prison, was paroled in 1937, and then would later die at Vanderbilt University Hospital at the age of 66, eight years after he was paroled. Now, Lee was probably not too happy that his last breaths were taken at a Vanderbilt University institution. At the time, the Commodores were the biggest rival of his beloved Sewanee Tigers. Uh, and, you know, when he attended the school, um, and still today, over 100 years later, the most popular cheer that rang out at Sewanee football games went a little like this. It said, rip them up, tear them up, leave them in the lurch. Down with the heathen, up with the church. Yea, Swanee's right. Now, uh, research has been done into the chant, and it seems to leave that the heathen is thought to be the Methodists in reference to Vanderbilt, which is a Methodist school. Now, in college, football was life for Luke Lee. I, he had just everything revolving around football, and had the position existed at the time, he undoubtedly would have pursued a future as an athletic director as opposed to a lawyer or a banker or even a senator. He was just that into football, absolutely loved the sport. And at the ripe age of 20, Lee was the student manager of the Suwannee Tiger football team. Now, in those days, the manager of the team was pretty much like an AD today. He dealt with scheduling, resources, finances, basically all of the parts of football 
that don't involve the actual on-field product. He was a businessman, and he was in the business of football, even in college. Now, Swanee was in a very rough spot. Because of their location on top of Monteagle Mountain, it was really hard to convince teams to travel and take either the train ride or the horse buggy or the car or whatever mode of transportation they took to get up the mountain to play them. So a majority of Sewanee's games were played on the road. Now in 1899, unable to find opponents because of how far west they were, the University of Texas invited the Tigers out to Austin to play. It was an offer Lee could not refuse, but he knew that the cost of travel would far outweigh any financial gains made from the trip. So he found a solution. Schedule games on the return trip to make up for those expensive train tickets. This solution would turn out to be one of the craziest things in the history of sports. Lee's idea on its face worked. Texas was already paying Swanee $700, which is worth about $20,000 today, to come to Austin. It was massive at the time. So, all he had to do was find someone else who would cover the rest of the trip that the 700 didn't cover. But then someone else became two someone else, then three someones, and in order to cover the cost of playing Texas, turns out the Tigers would have to play four teams on their return trip. What that means is round trip. Five games in one week. Swanee's schedule would have made Nick Saban shudder regardless of how many days of rest they had in between each game. They started off with a short trip to Atlanta, where they played Georgia and Georgia Tech. Then, they went home and played Tennessee, followed by a game against Southwest Presbyterian, who are now known as Rhodes. Then they went on their famous road trip, where they played Texas, Texas A&M, Tulane, LSU, and Ole Miss. They played their final home game against Cumberland before traveling to Montgomery to face Auburn. Now, this whole schedule took place over the course of about a month, from October 21st to November 30. Looking at this thing is like looking at the book of exactly how not to run a football team. I mean, the games against UGA and Tech were played within three days of each other. Then there was only a five-day break before the Tennessee game. The Tigers didn't even get a full seven days rest until after the game against Ole Miss at the end of the second road trip. This was a schedule that was made with complete disregard for player safety, held anything resembling sanity, and it had only one thing in mind. Money. Luke Lee was heralded as some sort of innovator, and he, and he was in many regards. When he was in Senate, he lobbied for an eight-hour workday. He strove to end child labor. He supported the creation of the Federal Reserve System. He even supported women's suffrage, which, for a guy coming from the South at that time, was incredibly liberal of him and ran in direct contrast to a vast majority of of his party allies. He advocated for the 17th Amendment. He took on political corruption in his home state of Tennessee. He ran a newspaper in Nashville and was the founder of the American Legion, which today supports America's veterans nationwide. He was opportunistic. He excelled in areas where many could not and still do not. But on top of all of this, he was something he was something else, something that evidences itself far more when you look outside of his work in politics, and a lot more when you look in at his work in his banking, his scheduling as at Swanee, 
his constant insistence to his dying breath that he was framed for bank fraud, it all comes together to reveal what Lee really was. An absolute maniac.